Yeah, my name is Sylvain Lavoie, or in French, it's Sylvain Lavoie, and I'm the Archbishop Emeritus of the Archdiocese of Kiwetan de Pa in north central Canada. Basically, it's the northern half of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, two provinces. 430,000 some square kilometers, so it's fairly large, but small population, 125,000, something like that. And um, so right now, I'm I'm retired from that position, but I'm also serving as uh, chaplain and spiritual director at the Star of the North Retreat Center in St. Albert. And I was invited to come here to do a workshop on the 12-step spirituality, uh, addictions awareness, and then a, a retreat to the Albates by Lorcan at our last NACOR gathering in Mississauga, Queen of the Apostles Retreat House over there. So that's how I ended up here. I guess it's journeying with people and uh, really connecting with where they're at and helping them, I guess, listening for them. Alice Miller, I think, is the one who said that all that people need to heal is a listening witness. So I think it's just being a listening witness, hearing people's stories, and then giving them some direction, some hope, um, being able to connect scripture with their lives, and also helping them to realize that they can forgive, that they can be forgiven, that God is loved, that they, they're loved by God, whatever their background is. Or, and that, that's really affirming and life-giving, um, just to be able to do that. But also, uh, just being present at the retreat house, and um, liturgy every, every, well, about four or five times a week. And lay people come and join us for the liturgies, and there's some sharing around the homilies that happen there. And so that, that's exciting, and being part of the team to a certain extent. I'm not on staff as such, but uh, just present and, um, and staying living with the Oblates just across the parking lot from the retreat house. So it's just a good place to be for a retired person and uh, actually kind of in some ways keeps me busier than when I was running a diocese. <laughs> I'm trying to slow down and, 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 and try to live what's supposed to be a retired life, I guess. But uh, no, it, it's all good. Building up the kingdom of God, basically. I think I was pretty fortunate to be assigned to work with the indigenous peoples. So that was walking into a new culture and learning a lot. I mean, uh, I became aware that there's different kinds of indigenous culture. In the far the north, it's uh, to be Catholic, is to, to be indigenous is to be a traditional Catholic. And then where I was in Beauval, sort of the north central part of Canada, it was kind of a mixture. People were aware of indigenous spirituality, but they were really mostly living, as, you know, as regular Catholics. A little further south, a couple hours, that was Plains Creek culture. And now you had the more obvious um, spirituality or the ceremonies, the dances, the costume, whatever, you know. In the north it was more of an internalized culture, and in the south it was more of an, an externalized uh, spirituality. And then just learning from the indigenous people, the different values, uh, like they had, uh, it was, uh, it took a major shift of gears for myself, you know, because their attitude towards work is quite different, towards um, time, towards money, you know, the humor is a little bit different, and, uh, uh, and like the value is, for, for the indigenous people, it's everything's about relationship. I remember visiting the first time, a young couple, and they asked me, Father, are you going to grow old with us? Well, I knew I was going to be there for six years, you know, kind of almost broke my heart, but, but that's what was important to them. Are you going to grow old with us? Because for them, relationship is everything. And if you're a friend, you're a friend for life, you know. So uh, it was all a good experience. Uh, and it was, I had to learn to live in both cultures and not to judge either one, you know. Uh, when I first got there, I was kind of said, gee whiz, you know, I mean, they, they, it's not like what I grew up with. But as I got more involved in indigenous culture and spirituality, then I began to sort of judge my own culture and say, well, gee whiz, you know, we're kind of superficial here and there and whatever. And then I had an experience when I went for my dad's funeral. Uh, it was in the middle of harvest. And um, so right after the funeral, my brother said, well, I'm going harvesting. I said, how can you do that? Because you know, in the north, everything stops. When there's a funeral, everything stops. Um, and everybody goes to the funeral and you spend three days, you know, with a wake and the funeral and whatever. And in the south, it was really different. You know, here we are harvesting right after burying dad. But then it rained a little later on. I realized, okay, totally different economy. Um, you know, if you don't harvest, that the crop's going to get spoiled. In the north, the muskrat, the deer, the, they're all trapping, hunting, and fishing. You know, you can take time off and, for a funeral. And then I realized it was just two different um, ways of living, 
two different spiritualities, two different cultures, and I had to learn to live in both. And I was able to do that, and it's been good ever since, I think, you know. Um, the, also, the, 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 the closeness to nature for the indigenous peoples, you know. I mean, now we're getting more that way ourselves at Laudato Si and care for the common home and whatever. I think uh, Pope Francis is moving us in that direction, but that's always been part of indigenous spirituality. And uh, I remember, you know, I, I went outside to get a branch off a tree for uh, the sprinkling of the holy water, you know, and one of the elders came around the corner and she said, Father, did you say a prayer before you did that? <laughs> and honestly, I had to say, no, I didn't. She kind of caught me, and I was really, for, for her, just, you don't do that unless you say a prayer. You, you respect nature, you, you offer something back before you take anything. And uh, here I'm the priest, I'm leading them, and, and they're teaching me, you know, how to have a proper relationship with, 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 uh, with creation. So that's been an enriching experience all, all along the line, yeah. Um, in terms of the, uh, the charism of Eugene, you know, when I took the ex um, uh, process, got to know him better. His love, his affection for his men, for the obits around the world, but also his love for God, you know, and being loved by God, growing up in a broken family and still overcoming that and having that experience of, of being unconditionally loved by, by God, by Christ at the cross, at the foot of the cross that really marked him and started him off in his pathway to, to being a priest and, and eventually a bishop. Uh, and the way he expressed that, that love uh, in his letters, writing to around the world and being in touch with... But also, uh, he, I think he was, he was very active. I mean, he had this, this temperament of the Mistral, the, that strong stormy wind that blows through Marseille at the time. But also he was a contemplative. You know, he would feel himself connected to God but also to all the albits around the world through horizon, through praying before the Blessed Sacrament. So I think it's a good model for us of uh, uh, balancing action and contemplation, and that I would encourage all of us to do. Um, but also the, just the way he was so solidly grounded in his love for the poor, you know, reaching out to the poor. I mean, Pope Francis is along the very same line, take on the smell of the sheep and uh, reach out, you know, go to the peripheries and the church is a field hospital for the world and <clears throat> that's Eugene de Mazenod, that's what he was, loving to go visit the poor, speaking their own language, Provençal, which inspired me to learn Cree, to try to learn Cree. I spent actually two years learning Cree, living with families on the reserve, uh, living in the welfare system, whatever, um, and uh, that was I wasn't doing ministry as such, and yet I look back now and I say, you know, that was very good ministry because I got to know people, and uh, they got to know me, and uh, walking in relationship with them, learning their language, which that gives them dignity, uh, because I become the learner, they become the teachers, and so I'm, I'm, I'm there as a student, you know, and that was a good experience as well. Uh, I wasn't doing ministry as such, but I think it was good ministry, because the oblates tend to be known as close to the people. And I think Eugene was close to the poor and close to the people, and we're called to be that. And for the most part, from what I'm hearing from lay people, uh, that's who we are. You know, we're, we're, we're close to the people. And uh, his love for Mary as well. You know, I mean, we're the obits of Mary Immaculate. Um, and I think he really lived, but I, I, I like to have this <clears throat> one sentence summary of our, of our theology, our Catholic theology. We're all returning, coming back to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son in the Holy Spirit with Mary, our mother. And I think that kind of sums it all up for me. And uh, I think that was what Eugene was living in his life, you know. Um, so, yeah, and then, of course, his approach to life, too. Um, I've always been influenced by St. Irenaeus. The glory of God is men and women fully alive. Well, I think Eugene lived that spirituality because he taught us help people be human first, you know, and then to become Christians and then to become saints. And I've been kind of following that. That's influenced my ministry. All the workshops I'm doing, the, the addictions awareness work I'm doing, it all starts with being human, like a spirituality of human being. And then you move into, you know, the, the journey to recovery or the, the addiction or, or the 12-step healing journey or whatever. But I, I follow Eugene's teachings, uh, help them to be human first and then Christians and then saints. And then, of course, his famous line, among yourselves, unity. And... Uh, we need to take that more seriously because, you know, within ourselves as oblates there can be such polarization and in the church and in the world today. Well, among yourselves, unity and zeal for others, you know, like really a passion to share the good news. And, and it is good news. Um, 
And I don't think people... Uh, Carl Rahner had a beautiful insight into uh, the words of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said, no, no. He said, they knew what they were doing. Uh, they knew they were killing an innocent man. Pilate knew that. The Roman soldiers knew that. The Jewish leaders knew that. Rahner's insight is what they didn't know was how much God loved them. And I think that's our big sin as, as, a, as, a, as people. We really don't believe in how loved we are by God. To totally unconditionally loved by God. We're, we're trying to earn God's love in different ways. We're insecure. We're trying to put other people down or find it here or there. And, you know, the good news is we're, <laughs> we're unconditionally loved by God already. We don't have to do a thing to make God love us more. And I think people need to know that, be convinced of that. And so that's part of our ministry. And in realizing it ourselves, you know, and then the fact that we can be forgiven everything we've ever done. Not only that, that, and this, this has stayed with me, it comes from uh, Archbishop Emeritus Adam Exner, who taught us that, you know, Jesus as the Messiah had a twofold role, to redeem and to sanctify. And you can find that in the scriptures, Psalm 103 especially, but it just means to forgive and to heal. And so, you know, we can be forgiven everything we've ever done, but that's on the surface. We have to go deeper and have healing for what made us do it, for our sinfulness. There's a difference between sin and sinfulness. And sinfulness is that which made us do it, and that's not our fault, it's just the way we are. It might be painful emotions like anger, resentment, or defects of character like stubborn self-will or false pride or whatever, and for that we need healing. And the good news is that Jesus came as the Messiah to heal us as well. So I call that a spirituality of weeding. <laughs> you know, if you weed the reeds at the surface, they just grow back. But if you take out the roots, then they don't grow back. And I, I live that way. I love gardening. I love weeding. It's a spirituality of weeding. I've been tackling thistles and dandelions and quack grass, you know, for, and now I'm working on the bellflowers in our front lawn at the Star of the North, trying to get rid of that. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a joy to be doing that because I think, well, that's what God's doing for us, you know, forgiving us and healing us. And it's good news. And, um, and for St. Paul, you know, the, the kingdom of God. My motto as a bishop is Redim Dei Intervos, which means the kingdom of God is among you. And that's from Luke chapter 17, verse 21. And that's the only place in the New Testament where he doesn't just say the kingdom is near or you're not far from the kingdom. He actually says Redim Dei Intervos, the kingdom of heaven is within you, it's among us. And that's been my motto as a bishop ever since. And that's what I'm trying to do is to help people realize the kingdom is right here. And you know, we have those kingdom moments, but we have to have the eyes to see them. And I'll give you an example. Uh, my latest book I published was, uh, it's called Claiming God's Love. So we thought we'll have a book launch. And I was expecting 10, 12 people maybe, you know, I'd be happy with that. Well, 75 people showed up. And it was just maybe about a month ago. And they just, everybody was just so happy to come together. Maybe it's a little bit of post-COVID feeling as well. But it was almost surreal, like the number of people who came. We had a, a the local musician in the parish. Uh, you, know, he, you know, he's not an expert or anything, but he had lost his wife, and so he'd written a song, uh, inviting her to sing with him, because he never asked her to sing with him when he was when she was alive, you know. And it really added a touch to that evening. So everybody was just just so pleased to be there and happy to be there and socializing and visiting and signing books and whatever. And uh, it struck me after that. Well, that's the kingdom of heaven. There was peace, there was joy, there was fellowship. Um, it was a great evening, people still kind of talking about it. And well, that was a kingdom moment, and the kingdom is here already. We don't have to die to go somewhere. <laughs> it's already here. And that's good news, and that's our job, I think, our task, our, as, a, as missionary albits especially. And I think as a retreat house too, that's our task. And just to be open to whoever comes and to share with them you know, hope and healing and, and possibility and that, you know, the, uh, the best is yet to come. I like that lady who said, bury me with a fork in my hand because my mother always used to tell me, keep your fork, the best is yet to come. And I think that's the attitude we've got to have as missionary oblates.